Uh, and uh, uh, I think Mark is here, Jessica, Samantha, but like I said, we're pretty much nearly all here. Um, so I think probably it is just getting on for a minute past, so um, let's make a start. I did suggest that uh, if you want, it might be a nice idea to unmute and have a bit more of a chat. But maybe in this first phase, it is going to be mostly me talking. Uh, here's one more, David Jones. Welcome, David, if you can hear us now. Um, so a, a lot of you, uh, I can see around the screen, are familiar with Domain the Bee from, from uh, some years back. Uh, there are a handful who are absolutely brand new. So I will give a short recap to, to explain sort of who we are and what we do. Um, but I'll keep that quite short because I know some of you have already seen the introduction that we did earlier on. And we're trying to focus today really on four different vintages of the main wine, Domain of the Bee. We've got a chance to kind of taste through those and chat about them. Um, I do hope that we have uh, enough time to, you know, to have a bit of feedback and a bit of questions. I want to also ask you what you think of these wines and I want to try and understand. I don't, you know, I know what I think, but I'd, I'd love to understand from a group of people, you know, whether you prefer older wine or younger wine, um, how long you think these wines should be kept for, whether you think some of them should be kept longer. Uh, one more coming here, Judith. Hello, Judith. I've now got 20 boxes on my screen, so I think that could well be it. We could all be here. So um, welcome, everybody. Amanda isn't yet with me. She's taken the dog out for a walk. It's taking a little bit longer than she expected. She promised to be home by seven, but uh, hopefully we'll see her shortly. Um, so, well, let's, let's kick off. Um, those of you who don't know us very well, I'm going to give you less than five minutes on who we are and uh, why we started. So Domain of the Bee is a tiny little project that Amanda and I started in 2003, I think. Um, 2004, we bought our first vineyard block. Um, we have four hectares in three separate little parcels of vines in the south of France, right by the Spanish border and right at the Mediterranean end. So sort of Barcelona, just north of Barcelona. Um, and um, just welcoming one last person in. So I think, yeah, we should all be here. So um, we have uh, these three little parcels of vines. We've been making wine for, well, 2007 was our first vintage. Um, these are all old vines. We bought them as mature old vines, but for the first few years, we didn't make any wine from our grapes. We gave our grapes away. But um, uh, we've been producing wine since 2007. It's been a kind of evening um, and weekends job for me. It's my, not my main profession. I'm, I'm in the wine business. Uh, I've been a buyer for a long time and I'm a consultant. So I do a lot of uh, work as a consultant. Right now, not so much of that happening at the moment, as you might expect, because of uh, it's very difficult to travel um, and wine involves a lot of travel. So I haven't been doing a huge amount of consulting, but um, the main thing is definitely my kind of evening and weekends uh, hobby. And um, we can see fairly early on that we really wanted to sell our wine to our, our own mailing list. So we, we have about 300 wine club members, 320 now wine club members, who um, every year buy a case or, or several cases of our wine. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to those people who, who are fantastically loyal. And um, you know, every year we write saying, you know, your, your case is here, and 98% of them take up their case pretty much every year, which is fantastic. We show people that seem to be enjoying what we're doing. Um, and then um, we do sell a little bit to restaurants and, uh, and, and bars and uh, um, through a few wine shops, but essentially we sell most of it ourselves. And those of you who know us well will regularly come to our house for tastings and uh, um, you know, we try and keep it fun and keep it entertaining. So that's essentially what we're, what we're aiming to try and do. Um, I'm just gonna move now to show you a little bit about where we are. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hopefully we'll be able to find, um, let's go here. My little presentation. Um, I did a uh, tasting for 67 Pall Mall. The um, uh, hang on, I've got the whole screen shared here. Let me just move this to present. Oh, yeah. 67 Pall Mall is so this is me and Amanda on the left. Um, uh, 67 Pall Mall is the wine lovers wine club, which um, uh, a bunch of people uh, got together and, and asked um, me to do a tasting for them. Actually, it was the Singapore branch. So I put some official slides together. So this is a bit more professional than we normally are. I'm just going to flip back to the beginning um, and take you through. Uh, I've had a, go a Google Earth today, but so for some reason not playing ball. I like to fly into the region and zoom around um, 
and it's a really nice way to see the vineyards, but it's some, for some reason it's not working at all today. So here we are in the, the Roussillon region. So this is France, hopefully you recognize that. This orange area is what's known as the Languedoc Roussillon. And this little blob down here, the bottom bit, is the Roussillon area. And that's where we are. So next slide, there's a big arrow there pointing at the Roussillon. This is the Roussillon. Um, the best bit of the Roussillon is this bit in the top part here. Um, and we are around the village of Mori. And Mori used to be famous as a village for making sort of fortified wine. But now um, a lot of vines there making extremely good dry red uh, table wine. Um, but that is the, the, the region. And these three rivers that come down from the mountains, the Agli, the Tet and the Tech are kind of de define the region and Perpignan's on a big plain and there's an amphitheatre of hills around here um, with uh, a big mountain here called uh, um, Canigou which is the main mountain of the Pyrenees that comes close to the Mediterranean. So that's where we are. Um, there's some stuff on rocks which you probably don't want to know about. It's a bit, uh, <laughs> wine people always go on far too long in my opinion about uh, soil and it's frankly very boring for most people. It does get interesting if you come and see us I will definitely make you pick up handfuls of soil and, and feel them and feel the difference between one soil and another. Um, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about soil in a minute but what you see here is an overhead view from Google Maps of our valley. Mori is this little village here. Um, this line of limestone rocks is quite tall, five six hundred meters of, of, of rock and that separates us from the Corbiere which is to the north and then this area of the south is the north of the Roussillon. And the other side of the valley is this limestone rock along here, which forms to two of them quite a sort of sharp, steep escarpment on either side of the valley. Our vineyards are, the first one we bought was this block here, we bought this block here shortly afterwards, and then this block over here last, and that's our Carignan. Um, the blob here is pointing at our little house that we bought some years later. So for the beginning, we just bought vines, we had no house. Uh, now we have a little house. And then the winery, which is not ours, it belongs to my friend Jean-Marc, is over here. And this is Ooh, about... Jean-Marc! This is about five, five... Was there a question there or was someone chatting to someone else? I can't... didn't hear what you said. No, sorry. Sorry. Um, bear in mind, if you are chatting, it's probably... If you're going to talk to each other, it might be best to mute at that point, because all of us can hear what you're saying otherwise. It becomes a bit like Gogglebox, and um, we, can, we can hear what you're saying as you're watching what we're, what we're talking about. So that's a little plan of where we are. Um, I did say a bit about soil. Those two limestone ridges, we now sort of made a cross section of that and you can see the white bit is the limestone and you can see it's been folded and there's two ridges on either side and then a the big bit in the middle of black schist which is where the village of Mori sits and a lot of the, um, the famous characters of the Mori region is down to this black schist which is a, a sedimentary um, uh, slate effectively it's like a crumbly slate um, and it's very very distinctive and very much only found in Mori and one or two other spots around the Roussillon. Um, that's the same thing which is a bit closer, the three vineyard blocks you can kind of see outlined in blue and we've got some de more detailed maps of those. Um, as we're talking I'm just going to quickly check my notes because I thought that um, I don't want to talk for hours and have you not taste anything but equally, I don't want you finishing your glass before you we, we sort of get on to really talking about that wine. But so I'm going to suggest you do have a, a, a smell and a sip of a couple of these wines. I'm going to suggest we taste them youngest to oldest. So if you've got them in front of you, if you line them up 2017, 2015, 2013, 2011, I think doing them in that order makes the most sense. Some wine tasters prefer tasting older to younger, but I, I quite like doing younger to, to, uh, to older. Um, and when, so, as I say, have a little smell and a little sip of the 2017 as we're going along so you can sort of get the picture. Um, this plot is the oldest and the first plot that we bought. Aston. Yes, question. Should we pour all four and then drink them over time or only open them as you tell us? So, very good question. If you happen to have four glasses or a glass for each wine in front of you, then I think it's a great idea to pour them all because they all will benefit from a bit of air. And you can also sniff one, sniff the other, and you can go between them. Just don't forget which is which. So if you've got a space in front of you and uh, put the bottle behind the glass, then you'll know which is which, and you don't get them mixed up. Or you can, if you're in the wine trade, you'll sometimes write on the glass as to which vintage it is, so you don't get uh, confused. It is easy sometimes to get confused in wine tastings, I've found. Um, so um, as we're smelling and tasting this, we'll see the vineyards where these grapes grow. Um, I'm just having a sip of my, my first sip of 2017, which is very nice. Here is Amanda. Hello. She has arrived. 
<laughs> no, Sam, we've been very organised. I'm actually going to switch off uh, screen oh. at the moment. It's great because I'm late, but just because on camera, he can't be mean to me about being late. <laughs> I, I already have been, so it's too late. <laughs> okay. I'm going to uh, take us off um, oh, virtual right. background. There we go. So you can now see Amanda properly. Hi, Ron. She has arrived. Now, you know several of these people, I think. Amanda. Uh, Wave to Amanda. <laughs> so we just started um, saying that we should taste the taste the wines and start with the 2017. So you've got I've actually got a whole set especially for you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, we spent the weekend uh, preparing samples, and it's quite a fun little exercise. And those of you who did the previous one might notice that the lids have changed on this one because the last time we sent them out, two people reported cracked lids and bottles that had leaked. In fact, I think we had one bottle that smashed this time around, which wasn't ideal. But um, hopefully, otherwise, most of you have received intact samples, but slightly better lids this time. No one's had a leaker this time, I hope? Maria did. No. Uh, Andy yeah. did. Maria. Andy, did yours leak or did it smash? Uh, just leaked. We had leaked. a slight leak as well on one of them. Sorry to hear that. Well, it, I tried to screw the lids on nice and tight, but um, hopefully most of you didn't. So apologies if that happens. Um, you know, we are refining this all the time, and this kind of feedback is really helpful. If we find a better bottle, um, my friends from the Bib Wine Company, um, if anyone's on their mailing list, they've just produced these beautiful little pouches of wine. Yeah, Amanda, I'll go and fetch them just to show you because we're just going. We may even try that technology a little later on. They're a hundred a milliliter, so a bigger a bigger serve, um, which means you get fewer per bottle. So this time we managed to get fourteen pours, fourteen of these little baby bottles out of one of our full bottles. Hence, why there's twenty eight people tasting. Um, they're, they're really cute. I think they're nicer than the 67 ones because they yeah, look well, like So thank you. I haven't, I haven't seen, I've only seen pictures of the 67 ones. Is it a 75 mil pour? I think? Well, no, it's just, uh, it looks more like a vinaigrette bottle uh, with, a very li with very little wine in it. <laughs> lovely. Yeah, no, they fill, the, they fill the airspace with argon, I think. Yeah, um, this is lovely though. But yeah, no, any feedback you've got about the samples and how they're tasting and you know, whether they did arrive smashed would be really helpful because each time we do this, we're getting a bit better at it. But yes, the, 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 you know, it takes us a few hours to get the bottles neat, neatly poured and then packed and then sent off. So I enlisted Sam and his girlfriend's help again this time. Um, here are the two little pouches. They are empty because we, uh, I had to taste them to check that they were tasting all right and they are tasting lovely. So we're about to do a 40 wine, a 40 person tasting of six wines each with the bib wine guys um, and so we'll see how these pouches work. Okay, so where were we? We were, we were talking about 2017 and we're going to taste it in a minute, but just bef before we do, I'm going to show you a few pictures back to, um, hang on, I've taken us off the Zoom, but I haven't put you on screen share yet. <laughs> taking you back to screen share, just to show you some pictures. Um, and uh, the three plots are the Cume de Wars plot, which is a, pretty much 100 years old. We, we were told it was 90 when we bought it, and that was 12, 13 years ago now, so um, we think it's over 100 now. Uh, the Back to Genève plot, which is looking over, if you look at the bottom right picture, you can see the village of Mori hiding behind that tree. So that's you know, a couple of kilometres away from Mori on, a, on a, a limestone escarpment. Is that Bugaret? Yeah, and there's a mountain here you can just about see in the distance, lurking in the distance. That's actually over the, the line of hills that separates Corbière from the Roussillon. So that's in the Corbière. It's the highest mountain in the, in the, in the Corbière region. It's also where the aliens came in 2012. Do you remember the Mayan apocalypse? People thought in France were all congregated around this mountain because they thought that, uh, that a chosen few were going to be uplifted from the earth and the rest of us would all be destroyed. Uh, luckily that didn't happen. And it turned out there were more police there than there were actual uh, believers. Uh, but it was, it's quite a mystical mountain and we love climbing it. Um, so that's the shape of that. And actually there's a couple more, this parcel here and this block here also belong to us, but I didn't manage to draw lines around them when I made these maps a while ago. Um, and then the last plot is the one you might see from the website. Uh, it has been the, on, on the website as the main front page in the beginning. That's our La Roque plot, which is a one hectare plot of pretty much pure Carignan. It's about uh, probably 80, 80 plus years old now. Um, so the wines, I've put the wines in the wrong order, stupidly. So um, I won't actually leave these slides up because they don't tell you anything more than the website really tells you. And you all know what the bottles look like, I think. Um, so we'll go Stop back sharing. out of, and then actually, I wanted to go through some, um, some oh. pictures. So as we start uh, sipping this first wine, this is the Laroque vineyard. And this is our 
uh, Wine Club Members Weekend. It was actually the, the day before the main uh, event when a few of the early arrivers had, had arrived and we were just doing a little tour of the vineyard. Um, so we had a, a bunch of, about 16 Wine Club members came out last vin uh, vintage for the harvest and we'll see a few more pictures. Um, this is a typical harvest picture. Um, uh, we normally get about 15 or 20 uh, pickers. They're not our pickers, they're Jean-Marc's pickers. Um, we can't have them exactly when we want them, but we normally get them within a day or two of when we need them. Um, and luckily, obviously, the top, a nice sunny morning. Uh, we often start just before dawn and sort of 7.30 a.m. at that time of year and get picking. And with that number of people, you can pick a block in about two hours. So everything gets picked into baskets um, and then taken down to this winery. Uh, this is Chateau Rock. There's Bugarach in the background, the mountain we talked about earlier. Um, this is what happens um, if we don't do things very artisanally and do them by hand. We, we forklift the barrels up to a destemmer. This machine here, what it does is it literally knocks the grapes off the stems. The stems come out one end, the grapes drop onto the sorting tray that you see below, and then these guys are busy um, picking out stems and any bits of wood and any grapes that haven't made the grade. And then they, the grapes drop into a barrel. <laughs> Um, this picture is being Amanda inside a barrel. So the wine club members all took their shoes and socks off and put grapes into a barrel and started crushing them by foot, which is the you know, traditional way, but it doesn't happen that much these days. But we thought it was a fun thing to do for, and I personally, I, every year I get two or three barrels that I, I tread by foot because uh, I rather like it. And because we do a few barrels without, without destemming the grapes, we chuck in the bunches and then uh, tread on the bunches. And the only real way to get them crushed properly is to stand on them rather than you can't put them through a crushing machine if they've not been destemmed. Um, this is some of us after having uh, washed our feet. We washed our feet before, before. and after, yeah. without just have to stress. Um, then the barrels go into a very unglamorous looking uh, chilled <laughs> container. Can. So this sits on the, you know, normally it sits on the back of a lorry and it can, it can be for <laughs> carting around frozen or chilled items. Um, or you can actually have it plunged on the ground and it sits there all harvest and it can be filled down to about two degrees. So we put our barrels of freshly picked grapes in here with cling film wrapped around them. Um, they chill right down to two degrees. We leave them in there for a week if we can. There's obviously new barrels arriving all the time. So we take old barrels out, put new barrels in. Um, but the purpose of doing that is to let the grapes sit, stew in the grape juice for a long time before they start fermenting. And the grape juice really gets dark in color and lots of fruit flavor comes out. And it means you can macerate a little bit less hard afterwards. So you do, if you do that pre-fermentation maceration, then you've got a lot of color and flavor out already and you don't have to macerate so much during the fermentation. Um, this is me. Uh, I'm not working with a glass of wine in my hand. I am tasting the <laughs> juice very professionally and punching down with one, one arm uh, into the, uh, the carignard tank. And th this is uh, the barrels that we had. This is a few couple of years ago before we uh, refurbished the upstairs where we used to do the barrels in between the, the concrete tanks and this is a punching down barrel so that we ferment them in these open barrels and do the punching down by hand. Um, we slightly overfilled this barrel here so it's all on uh, the left. On, no one can see where you're pointing at. Yes you can't I'll be in my mouse here to point. Um, and so yeah as the wine ferments it lifts the grapes up so you can have it sort of two or three inches below the level uh, and then as it ferments, the, the whole lot lifts up and grapes start falling out. So I've learned to fill the barrels a little bit less deeply than that. Um, uh, here are some pictures of juices. So these are coming out of the cold container before they start fermenting. And the difference in colour is largely due to the grape variety and the, uh, the, what, the um, vineyard. So on the right here, you've got uh, a carignan. Um, and all of these, I think, are Grenaches. And that one is a particularly pale grenache that's had... I think that's probably the whole bunch barrel that had less maceration than the rest. And that's the color of the juice naturally when, it, when it's first crushed. Um, you can have very, very pale juice from red grapes when it's first crushed. Um, right, I wanted to now show you a video, if that is okay. <coughs> so I'm going to go to, hopefully one of these is, yeah. It should be YouTube, and there's a few videos up on YouTube. Uh, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, let's skip back, skip back to the beginning. This is actually the club members' barrel, and so every um, two or three days after the club members went back home, I made a little video and just um, filmed it and sent it into them. I think it's probably no point in trying to hear the, the commentary because um, you won't be able to hear it, I don't think. But this 
illustrates the, the barrel uh, after it's been in the cold fermentation and it's been taken out for four or five days and started warming up. So the fermentation is just beginning and in a minute I'm going to push my hand down and you'll see bubbles. And when you see bubbles it's an indication that underneath there you can see that sort of slightly scummy looking bubbles. That's an indication that yeast has started and that the alcoholic fermentation is beginning. Um, and you can see the colour starting to deepen. Um, every day you push your hand sort of deep into the barrel. I'm, I'm actually feeling for the temperature here and around the sides I can feel it's a lot warmer. So where the air temperature is warming the side of the barrel that's where the wine first warms up and then the yeast starts to be more active there which warms it up even further um, and it goes from two degrees from inside the cold container once it gets to sort of 15 14 15 degrees it starts fermenting and then it ferments up at 18 19 20 24 26 degrees you get our barrels up to about 26 degrees naturally they just heat themselves up after a while that's nearly your armpit going in. yeah that's just, i mean you, I was basically saying that as you push your hand deep down, you're still feeling grapes and stems all the way down. It's only when it starts fermenting, the grapes collapse and flatten and you, you can feel that you punch through the grapes and you get down into the wine down below. But for the beginning of it, it's basically grapes almost, almost all the way to the bottom. Is there Just any filmmakers watching? Do give Justin a couple of tips on how to perhaps not get quite so much camera shake when he's doing it. Well, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to hold the video and uh, do it myself as I'm, you know, it's a one man band. Yeah, so there was one other video that I was going to uh, look at, which hang on a moment while I just tee that one up. So, Justin. Actually, I'm not going to do that because I think we're running uh, a bit late. So I'm just going to move back to chatting about the wine. So shall we um, have a taste? I think you probably all have had a bit of a, a, a chance to smell and taste. Has anybody, apart from David, got four glasses lined up in front of them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh Sh Shane has. Excellent. Shane and his partner. Uh, and Alison looks like she has. That's good to see. Well, look, in that case, you're going to be able to flip from one wine to the next. Yeah, the rest good. of us are going to have to focus on one wine, down it, and then get on to the next wine. And they won't have any of the previous wine uh, in, it, in, in order to compare. Do you want to give people two minutes? To see well, look, if you do happen to have a couple of spare glasses, it might be worth going and getting a cup. So at least you've got two glasses each and you can compare one wine with another. If you want to go and do that now, please, please do. The rest of us, while they're gone, quickly. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Have a Justin, smell. Justin, you were so, so um, I'm finding this 2017 really lovely mm. and juicy and um, mm. it's got a sort of, I'm actually, mouth, my mouth is watering from smelling it. Um, it's, it's always a good sign that when you feel that you you know the nose invites you to take a take a take a taste because uh, some wines don't always do that uh, and wines that do you know they can feel your mouth watering it's usually a great sign so um justin you were saying about punching the grapes down i don't know if you manage to keep your wines reasonably cool if you can serve them at 18 that's probably ideal for our wine and most red wines nowadays are served too warm because room temperatures have gone up um, central heating and people are used to living in 23, 24 degrees. It's a bit warm for serving most wine and relatively rich, full flavoured, quite alcoholic wine like ours sometimes tastes a bit more alcoholic at 24 than it does when it's 18. So we'd probably like to serve a wine slightly cool. Having said that, these are definitely at uh, yeah. the 22 degree end of things because they're sitting in my warm office wow. under a light. I think you should, when you taste it and you know you do all that funny stuff with your Sorry. mouth, mm -hmm. I think you should be really close to the camera so people mm. can see what you're doing. No, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Um, so maybe um, we can unmute at this point and start uh, sharing some thoughts. Can you taste the, can you feel the tannin in the mouth? So in the mouth, you can feel a little bit of heat from the alcohol. There's also a little bit of grip from the tannin. And this is quite a young wine, so you definitely should be experiencing some tannin. <laughs> And it's quite freshly, um, acidity is a word we use in wine a lot. Um, it doesn't sound like a positive thing, but it's really important. All wine is, is acidic. If uh, water, you know, neutral water is a pH of seven, a lemon juice has got a pH of between two and three. Wine's pH is usually between three and four. There are a few wines that are below the 2.9 really acidic wines and a handful of wines are above four but the pH of wine is on the acidic side and it's definitely got a high level of, of acidity compared to lots of other things you eat and drink and make that's what partly makes it mouth-watering 
And if you're in the wine trade, you'd love to talk about acidity because it's what gives the wine longevity, the chance to age for at least length of time. And if you have no acidity in a wine, it, it uh, has less, it, it falls, to, falls apart quicker. Um, whereas you know, our wines, we, we think in our area, although it's hot, retain a reasonable level of acidity, which keeps that lovely mouth-watering freshness. So I think this is a wine that is, you know, has a good 10 years ahead of it. We bottled this pretty much exactly two years, three, four months ago. Um, no, I lie, a year, and, a year and four months ago. We just bottled the 2018. Um, and I think this wine is just beginning to really open up and, and taste lovely. So if you're the wine club member, this is the wine you would have got last year. Um, and at the time, last year, it was probably really a bit too young. He's moving seat. Amanda's moving seat because there's still the sun's in her eyes. Yes, I can see why. I might we could shut the blind, actually. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I have to say I love drinking these wines young because I love that uh, salt of juicy, big fruit. I, I used to say uh, one of the motivations in my winemaking style is when I was a, a young lad in my physics classes, I used to go and buy... I may have said this anecdote before, but I made for half pound of wine gums, and I would go and divide them all by colour. Um, I'd also give half of them away to my friends, so that, that enabled me to feel not guilty about eating wine gums throughout the whole of my physics class. But I then, I then eat them in reverse order of colour: the pale ones first, and the dark ones <laughs> last. And that moment when I got the sort of five black wine gums and shoved them in my mouth, and that kind of all at once, they all go in the mouth at the same time. That kind of assault of flavour of those black wine gums is definitely what I'm after <laughs> in, or used to be after in winemaking terms. I definitely love that big flavour that, uh, you know, almost, um, the, it gets the side of your mouth here with that sort of lovely, you know, rich acidity and, and, and deep flavour. And I think that wine, this wine sort of delivers a, a good amount of that. If you're more of a fan of very delicate wines, then, uh, we, you know, the Genou is definitely a lighter, softer style. And, and B-side too, but the domain of the B are always trying to aim to make quite a big wine. I think it's probably time to move on to 2015 now. Um, there are two questions. Oh, I have a couple of questions, yes. What's the effect of leaving stalks it, yeah. on? Um, very good question. Um, <laughs> quite complex, I suppose. First of all, stalks are green, and if you pick the grapes off and eat the grapes, they're lovely. But if you bite the stalk, usually, I mean, try this when you go to the supermarket, if you bite the stalk of your bunch of grapes, it's maybe not in the supermarket. <laughs> no, 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 when you bought the grapes and brought them home, the stalks can be unpleasantly bitter. Um, and I spend a lot of time running around at harvest um, biting stalks because um, I'm looking for when the stalk has changed to be a slightly nutty taste and the, the wood has started to lignify in the stalk, you can have some wonderful structural tannins that come from the stalks. And therefore, including those stalks when they're, when they're riper is. Um, brings some flavours to the wine but also the green edge also brings a little bit of freshness and a bit of acidity so I think you get a bit more uh, a bit slightly lighter style the, the stalks actually absorb some of the alcohol so if you leave the stalks stalks in all the alcohol gets made and then you throw the stalks away and they take some alcohol with them so we get about a degree 0.6 to one degree less alcohol in the barrels we've left the stalks in than the same wine the same grapes from the same vineyard where we've taken the stalks away already so that's quite a useful tool. We're, not, we're trying to keep our alcohols lower, but we want to make our grapes ripe and tasty. We don't want to, we don't want to pick them too young when they're not... You're all familiar with eating fruit. You know, we all go to the supermarket and select our fruit. You, you, you must have all had a peach or something that wasn't quite ripe. It's a bit hard. It's not juicy. The sweetness isn't there. The flavour isn't released. And then when you buy a really beautifully ripe fruit, it just has so much more flavour. The apricots from around us, we were down there two weeks ago and uh, we bought back some apricots because they're just so sensationally flavourful <laughs> when they're really nice and ripe. The trouble is when you pick grapes when they're sensationally flavourful, the alcohol level is 15, 15 and a half, sometimes 16 degrees. And therefore anything we can do to then keep that flavour but keep the alcohol lower by using a yeast that converts slightly lower alcohol levels, you can get about a half degree difference by choosing a different yeast. Um, or by using the stalks, that, that will help. So that's one of the reasons we, we leave the stalks in. We've also got a question from David about punching down. So what I was doing there with my hand, um, the early stages of punching down, so the grapes all rise out of the fermenting liquid and the, the top starts to dry out. So in order to keep the, the, the fermenting wine below and the dark coloured grapes, which contain all the colour and the, and the tannin, mixed together, you have to push them back in and stir it around so that the 
the top doesn't dry out and because the wine, the, the wine stays in contact with the grapes, so, so you start extracting the colour. So I think we're moving to 2015. Where's your glass? There you go. Uh, I'm going to, we haven't got spare glasses, I'm afraid, uh, so I'm going to make this. Um, after drinking 200 millilitres of wine, I, I can guarantee no one is going to be inebriated. That's mine. And you've got yours. Thank you. So, on to the 2015. We had this in the Gosh, and that's um, starting, I think, not just a smell of fruit. So, I think the 2017, the primary smell was really big, rich, um, fruit gummy fruit, but you know, lots of it and lots of fruit. This has got a slightly more subtle smell. Um, I, I'm not, as I said I, before, I'm not a great believer in, in sort of spending too long to, trying to, to name things that I can smell in the wine. You will may have particular things that you can smell. Um, sometimes our wine smells quite slaty. Um, now the soil is slaty, it might be a fanciful thing, but I think sometimes you, in wine you feel you can smell the soil in the wine. So there's been a lot of research into this and people are now saying you really, there's nothing that comes from the soil that you can measure in the wine. The grapes don't, the, the vines don't pull up minerals from the roots in a form that you can smell, but definitely vines that grow on certain soil types have a different flavour in the wine. And so um, I think there's a mineral element to the nose on this wine that smells a little bit like, like slate. Um, yeah. There's also a little bit of herbs, I think. I'm getting a bit of, of aniseed. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising because a lot of the um, the, the, the flora around us are, are, are herbs. And there's a lot of fennel that grows around us and fennel has a sort of um, anise kind of smell to it. So I sometimes get a waft of fennel on some of our wines. I just hadn't really particularly noticed it on this 2015 before, but I definitely picked it up when I smelt this. Why don't you ask people what they can smell? Mm. And I, well, I, I kind of, I talk with asking, if anyone has a strong smell, smell impression, please share it. If you don't, then don't worry at all. There's no need to start trying to name and um, uh, just to discuss the smells of wine. It's quite difficult because most wine smells of red wine, ultimately. Um, but when you've got a couple to compare, it's quite interesting to compare them. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, definitely red wine. Definitely. Uh, got Edward, uh, uh, was Edward there saying it smells like red wine? <laughs> yeah, correct. Gold star to Edward. Thank you. <laughs> but it's definitely... No, that seems like... Uh, so Martin says round tree fruit gums. Uh -huh. Yeah, yep. Yeah, definitely got that. And definitely herbal from Samantha. Thank you. Samantha was one of the people who came out and uh, lent her feet to our wine last year. And um, in fact, hang on, there's a few other people here. And, uh, actually, no, John, John Seal isn't, isn't on the call. He, no, he's, John has kindly um, shared our wine with a couple of his friends. So Shane, I think, and um, I'm trying to remember John's other friend. <laughs> uh, he's only got two. You're both um, <laughs> the courtesy of John Seal, who's one of our club members who also came out. So this is the 2015. Um, Definitely herbal and, 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 and Samantha also loves this one, which is great. Can you all see the chat? If you um, if you click on the bottom of your screen, I don't know how experienced you are as a Zoom user, but down at the bottom, there's a, uh, if you float your mouse over it, there's a chat function. And on the chat, we've got the chance to, um, first of all, ask a question. So if you want to float something or, or say something or share something, uh, do share it with everybody or just ask us a question and then we can keep, um, keep a bit of a dialogue going. Otherwise, most of you are muted now. And I, again, it feels like talking to a a room full, full of, of uh, silent people. Um, I normally prefer talking to people who, who talk back. I can talk back. Mm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll do a comedy show. Well, I, I'm loving this now. I think it's, um, you know, I shouldn't be saying this about my own wine, but I think oh, I, 2015. <laughs> yes, it is my wine. Our wine, remember? It's our, our wine. wine. It's our wine in every respect, um, <laughs> except for the amount of work that went into this. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, I, I'm just thinking, this is really hitting the spot. I think it's absolutely in a, a lovely place now. It's open. Um, it's gorgeous colour. You can still pick lovely fresh fruit. Um, there's still fruit flavours there, but it's melding into a more seamless, rich, complex palette. It's no way has it got, got to the point where it's coming, reaching some, some, uh, uh, some aromas that are you know, negative. Sometimes when, when wine's aged, they get a bit oxidised. This is definitely not showing any signs of that. I think it's absolutely lovely at the moment. And how long do you think it's another eight years? I think I'm forming the impression that our wines, I say to most people, are sort of two to ten years from, from bottling. 
that's probably the, the window. But I think, you know, four, five, six years is, is probably the sweet spot. And this is 2015, so it's now five years old. Um, it's been in bottle three. for three years. Uh, and I think it's tasting absolutely lovely. So um, you know, <laughs> please do share your thoughts. Uh, oh, I see. I've got questions being asked, but I'm not hearing them. So a lot, anyone who's asking a question that I'm not hearing, you may be on mute. Or I may have turned the volume down a bit too low. You turned the volume down. Well, no, 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 it wasn't that low. I think Someone say something, please. Hello. Hello. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you the volume can. was too low. Well, the volume was quite low, but I heard Edward speak earlier on, so it was... <laughs> Okay, there's, there's quite a lot of, I can see quite a lot of people on mute here. Yeah. Yes, a lot of people are on mute. Over half. Over half. Are we off mute? Are we off mute? You no. can, you're yes, welcome. You are. You're off, no, yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, look, you're welcome to come off mute and, uh, and ask a question if you'd like to. Um, I've got a question about food matches. For, mm, for mm. Well, yes, I'm, I'm, my school of thought when it comes to food matching is. Uh, anything you damn well please <laughs> because I think for a long time people in the wine trade have sort of played up the food matching and people in restaurants really really go on and on about food matching and if you work in a restaurant and the chef is producing amazing food and you've got amazing wine to taste and you're able to pair this wine with that food you know and really do it every day you do form an impression that this wine and this food really go better <laughs> together and it's worth asking the sommelier about food pairing because you, you, know, you will know what works well for them. But first of all, I'd say that that doesn't, isn't necessarily shared by everybody. And the rest of us don't get the chance to spend our time so obsessively pairing one thing and another. And often you've got a bottle of wine in the wine rack and you're cooking something and you kind of hope they go together. And I did something a long time ago when I worked at Waitrose, which was quite a, I think quite a fun thing to do. We took eight wines and we took eight food types and there was cheddar cheese, a bit of steak, a bit of smoked mackerel. Um, I can't remember what they all were, but things that, you know, major ingredients you might uh, encounter in your kitchen, you might serve uh, with, with wine. And we did tasting and I said, look, you can't taste every wine with every food because that's 64 combinations and we're all going to be horribly drunk at the end of it. Don't try that. But for each bit of food that comes out, try two or three wines and just try one with the other and see what you think. And I drew a big grid up on the, on, on the chart. And I wanted to try and work out who was voting for which combination to see if we could pick what worked better. So I was expecting the Malbec and the steak to have lots of votes. Um, and it did, it had quite a lot of votes. But uh, at the beginning I said, the one thing, you know, I'm open to anyone liking anything, you're probably not going to like the smoked mackerel with the big Australian Shiraz, because that's probably not really going to work. And at the back, at the end, two guys at the back, they had their hand up at the end going, that was our favourite combination. We really liked that. <laughs> And I didn't know if they were just being a, a mischievous or whether that, that's what they really thought. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely of the school of thought that the rules are only really there to guide you into what's sort of generally accepted as a good match to help you make the right choices. But honestly, whatever you like is probably a, a good bet. Having said that, our wines are big and they are alcoholic and they're tannic and they better generally with something to eat. We have a lot of, lasa a lot of um, uh, salami and cold meats, uh, um, charcuterie, uh, or salumi in the Italian uh, mold. Fennel salami can be absolutely lovely with our wine. Um, garlicky stuff, uh, um, cheeses of various sorts. Hard cheese is, is, is usually a good bet. Don't drink soft cheeses with our wines, but hard cheese can be very good. Uh, and, then, and then meat stews and, um, and, and meats, uh, grilled aubergines, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a really interesting question from Todd and Annie about what do you think the differences should be between the 17 and the 15? Which might relate to Mark's question, which is about how much difference does the weather make to the different years? Yep, well, great question. I tried to download some weather data to try and illustrate this talk, but I couldn't go far back enough. Correct. And also it's, it was daily and hourly sunshine <laughs> rainfall data that was really hard to get it into any kind of meaningful visual presentation. I will do one day, do some, when I'm really mm -hmm. bored or have really not much else to do, produce some really good graphs that show you sort of month, month by month and compare one year versus another with the weather. Um, but uh, I haven't been able to this time around. But yes, the weather does vary quite a bit and it does make a difference. The most different wine in this lineup is probably the 13 when it comes to weather. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
but the, the 15 and 17 were quite similar in lots of ways. So I think both very, very good years. Possibly the 17 is the best of the two. I thought when we made the 15 that it was equal to the 11, which I had thought was the best year we'd made. So we've got three of the best years we've ever made here. And then the 13, which is, I think, a, a lovely year, but in a very different style. Um, so it may be more interesting to talk about that when we come to the 13 and talk about why the weather in 13 was so particularly different. Um, between the 15 and 17, I, did, I think the difference is 15 was always intensely fruity, more so than the, the sorry, the 17 was always intensely fruity, more than the 15. Um, but they both had that similar, very bright, vibrant fruit and a lovely balance, not too big, not too hefty, uh, but a certain amount of elegance, but with a lovely concentration of fruit. And I think that the main difference to them is just the age now, that the 15s had a little bit of extra time in bottle and the 17s a bit brighter and younger. Right, moving on. Shall we move on? <laughs> I'm putting this back in the bottle now. Um, otherwise, I'm mm. going to start slowing my words, which is acceptable. I know it's, this is a wine tasting. I should be able to slow my words. Uh, okay, on to the 13. Now, when you have these bottles, like the ones lined up in the bottles, I don't know if anyone really had a close look at the colours. Uh, it's probably a bit late now to compare them. I should have done that at the beginning, but this has always got a slightly lighter colour. Um, and the 11, in contrast, when we come to that, is probably the darkest of the lineup. Um, so, the, rig, the, the real difference in this vintage was, um, I'm going to cast you back to the year of 2013. I remember it well because we were, you know, we live in London and we're in London much of the time. We're out in France maybe, I get there probably 10 to 12 weeks a year, uh, five weeks of which is during harvest, maybe two weeks of which typically is sometime over the summer. Um, we'll normally try and do another week, maybe at Christmas or maybe at Easter as a holiday. And then I go lots and lots of short trips for uh, specific reasons, for blending, for a bit of concentration on the vineyards. Um, but we weren't really substantially there during March um, in 2013. And 2013 was a year that Feb January and February were relatively mild and it looked like things were starting to happen in the garden towards the end of February, as you sometimes see, you know, a few blossom trees start to make an appearance and it looks like spring is coming. And then March was bitterly cold, pretty much the whole of March, really cold. It, it completely shut everything down. Everything that was growing just stopped. And the normal growth that would have been happening in early March just didn't happen. And it was really into sort of second week of April before that started to, to happen. So we didn't get bud burst uh, until really quite late. We were really three to four weeks later than normal in France. Um, and the same true in English gardens. Uh, the blossoms didn't come out. The, you know, there were daffodils and snowdrops in January and February, but then no more flowers. But they all had to wait till mid-April, mid, mid really, for the flowers to come out. And that was just a particularly cold snap. And that set everything back. So the key things that happen in the vineyard in the year are the pruning, which is sort of the end of the year or the beginning of the next year, in the winter, that December, January, when you cut all the growth from last year. Once the leaves have fallen off, you cut the canes and you get the vine ready for next year. And then nothing happens really in uh, December, uh, January, February, March, if you've, once you've done your pruning until bud burst. And bud burst is when the sap starts to rise in the plant, the canes that you've cut off, leaving a little um, couple of inch um, spur, which has got a couple of buds at the base of it, those buds start to swell. And once they're swollen and then the leaf starts to emerge, that's called bud burst. So as soon as you can see the first buds open, um, bud burst has happened. Uh, from that point on, you're really, really vulnerable to frost. Because if, if you get a frost at that point, who remembers here, Really bad frost in, in April. I have a question. Yes, please do. This related. Yes. The, the pictures that you showed us earlier on of yeah. the uh, vineyards seemed really barren. Um, not just the type of soil, but the number of uh, vines per uh, square meter or whatever it is. Is that, is that related at all to what you're talking about now? Or is it just the fact that some bits are less burdened than the others? So, I mean, it's a very good question. So, first of all, during the year, the you know, in the winter, there's no leaves on the vine; they're just stumps, and um, then you start to get some green growth. And then, about now, in the middle of the summer, the growth is really very vigorous. So you get these big bushy vines, and so you know, if you're looking at the overhead photographs of the vineyards to look at the density of green. Depends on when those photographs are taken. If they're taken in the middle of the summer, um, 
you sometimes get vines that almost touch other vines. Some of the, the canes will actually link up with canes from other vines and they'll join together. And you, you, you can't walk between them because you have to break the link. Um, and there's a lot more green vegetation in the vineyards in, in June, July, August than there is in uh, March, April, May, when it's, you know, very, March is almost nothing and by May it's, it's filled out quite a bit. So yes, it does depend on the time of year. Um, and our vines are you know, reasonably close together. You can't get tractors between them. Um, so Mark, we're just back in 2013. Um, everything was really late. So the, I, I, wrote, I noted down the harvest dates. We normally pick. So you've got the, the, the key moments are pruning, bud burst, flowering. Um, flowering is uh, early on in the cycle. The vine uh, opens up, the bud opens, the leaves start to form, the, the, the shoots start to grow. And then quite early on, you see this tiny little bunch of, it looks like a baby bunch of grapes, but actually it's the flowers. And as the vine grows in, um, uh, in France, it can typically May, in fact, it was flowering when we were out there in, uh, in, in late May, uh, late May or early June, the, the little tiny bunches start to flower and then set into bunches. Um, and that's a crucial moment. If, if it's really windy or really rainy during that time, the flowering doesn't work very well and lots of the grapes fall off the bunch and you end up with a poor flower, a poor, a poor fruit set. Um, in France, they call it coulure. And uh, um, coulure is, is when the, the, the fruit doesn't set very well, lots of grapes fall off and you end up with a sketchy bunch with a few grapes on it. So we have a big problem with that every year. Um, so the, the weather during that period is quite crucial. In England, they used to say that that used to happen every year around Wimbledon. Now we don't have Wimbledon to guide us now. When is Wimbledon, Amanda? It's uh, late, ju late June? Yeah. Yeah, it's normally late June, early July, I think. Yeah. Crazily this year, because we had such a hot and dry uh, spring, we've had flowering nearly a month earlier than normal in England. So we've had flowering in late May, which is almost unheard of in England, because normally it's late June, early July. Um, so it's an early year in England. That's probably a good thing. Um, the harvest day. So the, so the next thing that happens after flowering is you, you, your bunch forms and it starts to swell and the grapes are they're green and even black uh, red grapes are green they at a certain point they turn black and that's called the raison and that happens usually in late july august i forget how many days after flowering it typically is but they do say that from the flowering to the picking is about 100 days um you need 100 days of good weather over that time to kind of produce the the, the good grape but the raison happens somewhere in the kind of 60 day mark after the flowering and then the last 30 40 50 days are the ripening of the grape until it's ready so the picking date is is pretty crucial if you have a very late flowering you have a, a late picking so the picking dates for 2011 no were, we're on 13 i know oh. well let's go the ones in the order we've done them the 2017 we picked in 22nd of september and the 28th of september this is the carignan and the grenache um 2015 26th of september and the 9th of october 2013, the 16th of October, we picked them both. So three weeks later than typical. And the 2011 was 21st of September and the 28th of September. So the 13 is marked by much later picking. And that and even then we didn't quite have the ripeness we'd normally have because they flowered a month later and we picked them three weeks later. They had a slightly less time to, to ripen. Um, so you've got a lighter style, less colour. Um, bit more acid, a bit less sort of vibrant fruit. Um, we still ended up with close to 15% alcohol, but um, we didn't do any uh, of that whole bunch of fermentation that, that helps reduce them. Justin, mm -hmm. uh, I may be misremembering, but was there a year you didn't release or didn't release everything because of weather? Um, You're right, yes, absolutely. The 2014 was a year we didn't make any domain of the bee. Um, we had with more it was more disease than weather disease sounds like a nasty word we had a nasty fruit fly called drosophila suzukii which is a japanese import which has now started sweeping through france and in certain conditions they attack healthy grapes most fruit flies only attack a grape once it's damaged but the suzukii attacks a healthy grape and there was a huge amount of them around that year and we had also some uh, some other um it was a little uh, a little moth called the uh, odomis which lays its eggs in grapes. It was a big problem that year. So those two things combined meant we had a really tricky year that year. Um, so it wasn't the weather so much as, as the, uh, well, the weather was sort of allowed the conditions for them to thrive, uh, which didn't help. You've got 10 minutes left. Okay, well, we're gonna taste through the 13, which uh, I'm quite really interested to know, 
of the ones we've tasted so far, who's going, this 13 is you know, close to the top, it's one of my favourites, but who's saying it's less, less lovely than the other ones? I say less. David? So who would vote for 13 being... Maybe do up or down. Yeah, well, th thumbs up for 13 is a vintage, and thumbs down for 13 is a vintage. Oh. So, oh, interesting. There's definitely a few thumbs up, but there's quite a few thumbs down. So, um, <laughs> I, I kind of agree. Really interestingly, some of the wine journalists really preferred R13. A handful of them, particularly what, ones, do, what do they know? Well, <laughs> precisely. So, particularly the ones who like, who, don't, who, who, who criticize wines for overly high alcohol and don't like big, rich, you know, cram the wine gums in your mouth kind of wines, the ones who like, who like delicacy and elegance, they found lots to praise in our 2013. And I always have liked it, but I don't like it as much. And I actually have a thought that it, it will age well because of the relatively high acidity. And I think it is beginning to soften and age really nicely. Katie's saying that she thinks so, great. <laughs> yes, I, I, please, I know, I know 13 I has know. Qu quite a lot of fans. So, um, you know, I'm not disparaging. I think it's a really good wine. But this is partly uh, an illustration of how wine is a matter of subjectivity. There's no fact when it comes to wine. It's a, a lot of it's about opinion and what you like and what suits your palate. And it's good to know that. If you're really enjoying the 17 and the, and, the, and the 15, you like the ripeness. If you love this 13, you like a bit more fineness, a bit more elegance, I think. So I think we should move to the 11, which uh, given the time, it's probably time. It's gone to my head already. Do, do answer Katie's question. How did you get to France in May? <laughs> Very good question. Um, <laughs> Or are you, are you not, not going to admit anything? No, no, well, yeah, we, um, we needed to get out for a couple of reasons. Our bottling was happening, and they'd been scheduled for the 4th of, of June. And then us, our very, very knowledgeable and uh, wise government, decided that we were going to start a quarantine on the 8th of June. So we knew if we got back after the 8th of June, we were going to be quarantined by the UK. France allows you to travel around. Um, right at the beginning, they had a very severe, severe lockdown. Um, but then they made it okay to travel for professional reasons. And we had a good business reason to go. So we, we equipped ourselves with as many bits of paper as we could that says, you know, the, the company with whom we bottle uh, and a new seller we work provided us with documentation saying we've got to come out and supervise the bottling. We had the papers that showed we own vineyards. We had everything with us just to go. We have a legitimate reason, but honestly not going to our holiday house officer. <laughs> really, I promise you, we didn't take the dog for that reason. We thought that might be a bit of a, you know, they're just, these guys are often a jaunt, aren't they? Um, so we, we had the paperwork and he looked at him and yeah, that's fine, no problem. You know, you won't have a problem in France because you've got a legitimate reason and you've got the paperwork. So we drove overnight. We all borrow the paperwork, Justin. <laughs> we all what? We all borrow the paperwork. Um, but it has our names on it. And, and so therefore you'd have to pretend to be me. And me. It won't be long, I think, before we're allowed to go to France. I think we have to, I think we can go to France now. I think um, you just get quarantined there when you get there because we're quarantining them. So they're doing it back to us. Anyway. Plus ça change. Plus ça change. We're moving on to the 2011, which I hope you've all poured now. Um, mm. Deep colour, big. Yeah. This is always an amazingly big year. Uh, a little story about the, the Carignan vineyard that we bought. When we first bought it, we bought it from a man called Lafarge, the same name as our winemaking friend, although not directly related. He was a man who, who was the president of the local cooperative, which is the place where everyone takes their grapes and they get paid out on the grape value and then the co-op makes all the wine and sells it. And he had never seen the product of his own vines on his own. He'd always had them mixed with everyone else's. Um, so he sold us a vineyard that I, I'm not completely sure why. I think it was getting a bit old for him and the yields are getting a bit low. So he sold it to us for, you know, not a particularly large amount of money, about 10,000 euros an acre, a, a hectare, which is not, not bad for lovely, lovely old vineyard. And way, way, way cheaper than any other part of, uh, of, of, of France. Um, and when he came to the cellar after having sold us this vineyard block, Richard, who was our winemaking partner at the time, gave him a glass of the wine from this tank and said, there you go, that's from your vineyard. And he was completely bowled over. He had no idea that his own vineyard could make a wine that good. He's, I think, regretting having yeah. sold it at that point. Um, and the Carignan sometimes is just black in colour. 
black as the, as, as the inside of a witch's hat. Um, and the 2015, do anyone remember the 2015 Carignan barrel that we made? David, did you buy some? You might have done the, the single barrel Carignan that we made. That's my favorite one you've ever made, I think. It was absolutely epic. I still have three or four bottles downstairs. Maybe we'll do it. We could do a Zoom tasting one day with that last, the last couple of bottles. <laughs> Well, if that would be popular, then then um, uh, yes, uh, we we will we will announce the Zoom tasting oh, of some sure. rare old bottles at a later date. Uh, but I, you know, I think it's an epic barrel, and the colour of the Carignan can be absolutely incredible. So I think this was a very good Carignan year with a really epic colour, and actually the Grenache also had good colours in 2011. And we we make a big play about our yields being really low, and they are ridiculously low. But it normally, is true that the yields the years we have a big yield are actually the best years. The early flowering, early picking, big crop usually coincides with the best quality. And that's definitely true of 2011 and it's definitely true of 2017. And it's pretty true of 2018. And it's partially true of 2015 as well. So some of the best years we've made had, had a reasonably early and really good quality um, uh, and, and big volume. And this was, you know, in our early years, the biggest volume we had and probably the best vintage. Definitely. I think it's still tasting really good. David, how do you find it? Definitely the best to last. It's delicious. It's lovely. What else do other people see? Let's see up or down if you think this is good or not. It's big wine, yeah. lots of tannin. Also, fair to say, lots of oak. More oak on this wine than some of the subsequent ones. Um, oh, got a, got a finger this way. What did Kate? Yeah, Guy was going. I think I think he likes it, but still likes the fifteen. Guy, likes the Guy, I think Guy likes the refined, delicate taste of twenty thirty didn't you guys? Um, I'm just looking at this. David's asking if we have any 13 left to sell. Um, Jancis R seems to have asked that question. David, are you masquerading as Jancis? I can't see which <laughs> screen you're in at the moment. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, we do. So <laughs> we, we, um, we like to keep enough of our wine to have a little bit of older vintage wine left to sell. Because we sell direct, uh, we, you know, if we just had the wine of one vintage, it'd be a bit boring. We couldn't compare them. So we have deliberately been keeping back some stock of 11. We've got a 150 bottles left of the 11, I think. Uh, we nearly sold out of the 12. Uh, we've got about three or 400 bottles of the 13 left. Um, and none of the 14, because there wasn't any. And a 600 or something of the 15, something like that. So, we, we, and that profile means that we will still have 15 in four or five years time. We'll have a, 100 bottles left, I hope. Um, and we'll always be able to do a mixed case of older vintages because it's very interesting to be able to taste them in a lineup together. Now, some of the restaurants that we supply like to take an older vintage. So we do sell a bit periodically of the older vintages. I'm keeping the 2011, it's wine club members only. So you can buy it if you want to. Um, we do put the price up after a while because I, I did the maths and worked out what we charge for storage. And um, it's okay for a year or two, but once you start thinking, I've sold this wine for three years, that's quite a lot of extra money. So when wines hit four or five years, I put them up in price by a fiver to reflect the fact that we've stored them that long. And so the 13 onwards, I think now are, are 30 quid a bottle. Um, but you know, I, I find this 11 is, is damn tasty. And um, what, do you, what, do, what do people, should people notice about it? Well, well it's first of all, <laughs> <laughs> it's red. <laughs> I like the I like the cordially, the aftertaste mm. your, really lingers and it, I mean I it's yummy yummy's not a wine term. sorry sorry what did that man say he likes the what the well, aftertaste the, the, a word that he used that I, posh word I, sorry, sorry I'm a master of wine and I haven't heard of it I just let it pass thinking you're yeah. joking <laughs> are you joking Justin, I, va I vaguely had heard of it, but it's not it's not a word I use a lot. But it, it's a <laughs> French word, I think, meaning the finish, isn't it? it means the length. Accordingly is the word for the taste after the wine's left your mouth on your still on your palate and everything else. Mm. Um, and there's a wonderful at uh, Chateau. What's the one? Um, Chateau Lafitte, not Lafitte, Lafitte. The other one, the, Hope. Smith or Lafitte. Smith Hope Lafitte has got a beautiful chateau and opposite is a spa, a spa. called right. La Croix d'Ali. And the, I know this will be non-PC, but the boys went into the wine and the girls of the family weren't allowed to go into the wine family for whatever reason. I don't know the exact history. So they developed a number of um, 
cosmetics under the brand La Cordelia, you'll see it in boots, you'll see it all over the world. But if you ever want to go to a great spa and have a massage with grapes, I recommend it's a really good, it's a really good spa. I mean, it's, that's disgustingly sexist and definitely don't approve of that kind of treatment in this modern day and age. But but you know, it's a, it's a very good spa and a nice hotel. So if you want to go visit Bordeaux, it's right. Well that, that's an old story, so it's from the past. From the past, but yeah. but, but uh, also it um, has some wonderful, two wonderful restaurants. So I highly recommend it. Just outside Bordeaux. Absolutely. If anyone wants any travel tips, do do um, do you know, drop us a line. If you're ever going anywhere and you want to know something about where you should visit, uh, I'm more than happy to answer that. So, really good question. I, I think it sounds like uh, David's the better person to talk to, actually. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll pass you over to David. So, we have a question from Andy who says, do, do I think 2017 will age as well as the 2011? Uh, I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. I think the 11 has always been a bigger wine with more extract. And part of that was about how we were making the wine then. Um, the way we're now making wine in, in open barrels is, excuse me, is much gentler. Um, by, by hand plunging two or three times a day, we're very, very gently extracting the flavours. We're not getting as much tannin and we're, we're consciously doing that because we don't want our wines to be such monsters that you can't approach them for a long time. The 11 is a lovely monster, but it is a monster. It's a really big wine. You know you've had a bottle of that you know if you if you wake up in the morning after having drunk a bottle of that you definitely know about it and um i'm definitely after a little bit more elegance nowadays so part of the richness of the 11 is the way we made it in those days which is a bit more mashing it around a bit more um extraction of flavor to try and get everything we could out and even i with my wine gum fetish have moved towards fruit flavor but not too much of that um of that heavy tannin and, and heavy extract Having said that, I really love it That's and I, I really admire it. And I think the 17 will be a little bit more balanced when it reaches that age. It's got acidity and freshness and everything to last. But when it is that age, it won't be quite as big as the 11. Jessica wants to know if we've got any 2011. We do have some. Yes, I think 150 bottles or so left to sell. Wine club members uh, should be able to buy it. Uh, it says members only, but I think when you log in as a member, um, you should be able to add it to your cart and, and buy some. £30 a bottle to normal mortals, but 24 to wine club members. So, um, yeah, please buy if you if you like it. And uh, we will one day do a sort of uh, a release of the old, you know, it's, it's available, but we'll do a kind of push and say this 11 is tasting absolutely spot on, um, which I think it pretty much is it now, really actually. Is. We might, maybe before Christmas, we'll do a special feature on the 11. It's gone eight. It has gone eight. Oh, sorry. Well, I, all I wanted to say is that, you know, um, we have covered all of the wines. There, I'm sure, are some more questions. I'd be more than happy to keep chatting for a little longer. But if anyone does feel that it's time for their supper, or they promise someone they're going to do something else, you know, do drift away at this point. Also, if you've got any feedback on the samples or anything that was you, know, you think we could do better, do let us know. We, we, we've got a couple more of these sessions planned. We then have a bit of a break, I think. Um, but we'll definitely do more in the autumn. And I, I do want to dig out some old bottles from the cellar. I may even offer some other wines from the region and just do a comparison of some of the best producers and that kind of thing. So if you want to keep on joining in, we'd really welcome uh, seeing more of you. There's a lovely comment here from Samantha who'd left a little bit in each, in, each, in each different glass and just revisited and her winners are 2015, very close second to 2013. Wow. So 2013 top wine. 2013 so, top wine. So, so Samantha, thank you. That's really interesting to hear because as uh, you're in good company because I think Jane McQuitty and I think even even chances might have really quite praised the, the 2013 um, and you know that, that is that, it's a lovely wine and, and definitely on the more elegant side and uh, you know there's no such thing as a wrong opinion when it comes to what you think you've had a chance to taste these four wines I've, I did I did think we might do an even vintage tasting in September or October sometime I, I might be in France at the time but I should have all the wines out there so we could do a 2010 12 16 and 18 because we'll have the 18s ready by then um there's no 2014 but if you're interested in that that would kind of complete the picture you'd be able to taste uh the whole panoply of the available wines of in fact there's no 2010 available but i've got some bottles in my cellar that i could do that with so if you're interested in that keep an eye out um Tyrion is saying thank you to antonia are there any other questions uh, a few uh a few comments saying thank you very much which is great um <laughs> 
Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you, your attentive listening and your, your sensible <laughs> well, we feedback and comments. We think oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Yeah, no, we've loved it. Thank you. It's been brilliant. Really That's interesting. Good. Here, here. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, the sad thing with this is sometimes is that several people who I have I know well but I haven't spoken to, so Katie Cornish Bowden, haven't spoken to you for a year or two. And I'm know. going to pick up some wine tomorrow, though. Okay, great. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Katie Guy. Can I ask a question? Katie Guy, I haven't seen you. Yes, yes do please do. do. Let, yeah. let everyone finish. I just want to ask something. Don't worry, there's no rush. Thank you. We'll say bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Nice to see you all. Bye. Bye bye. bye. See you again bye. next time. So some of you are doing future tasting, so we will see you in a couple of weeks. So, David, what was your question? Two questions, really. You know, you talked about different barrels and whatever. Do you, I assume this is a stupid question, actually. Do you trace, can you say that that bottle that you're drinking there came from this barrel? Or, or is it not as, or how far down does the, because you said we're going to try this on this barrel and see how it works. And I wonder yep. if you're able to taste it at the end and say, oh, that worked better than that. I'm just hey. curious. It's a very good question. So one of the joys of fermenting in separate barrels is that you get to keep the wine separate for as long as you can. So um, if you ferment in a 500 litre barrel, you have about 450 kilos of grapes, you get about 300 litres of wine. So when you put them into a barrel, you, if you want to put them into a 500 litre barrel, you have to blend two barrels together. So we will typically get two similar barrels and blend them into one, but then that barrel will stay the same barrel all the way through. Right. And only at the very end, when we decide which wine it goes into, will we blend it or bottle it as a single barrel. So we get to follow it, but we'll normally at the end say, well, these six barrels go together to be Domain of the B. Yeah. These two or three barrels go to the B side. That one or two barrels goes to the Genou. And so the Genou barrel is, is usually a single barrel with sometimes a half barrel or a bit of press wine in it, depending on. So we normally bottle 500 litres or 725 litres, or even sometimes a thousand litres to make Le Genou. And that is very specifically from one or two barrels that we've tracked all the way through. And that's well, we are, I think we are going to track the, um, the barrel that people actually crushed with their own feet, yep. because that was such an exciting experience. Oh, right. and everybody wants to know what that particular barrel tasted like. But, but it will be blended in to make the Genou or whatever. Well, so be... that barrel, I, uh, it, it depends. Now, this is a commercial decision because first of all I have to be happy to leave that barrel out of Domain of the Bee right and I, having tasted them last I think I might, I might be but also the club members have to promise to buy most of it <laughs> because how many, how many bottles is that that's um 300 little, so this was a 500 litre barrel uh, that had uh 450 kilos of grapes in it that we trod and therefore we produced about 300 litres of wine 32 different feet so we put bottles. we put that 300 litres into a 225 litre barrel and the rest into a, a, another barrel. So there's a 225 litre barrel of that wine and therefore that'll make about 300 bottles. So if the wine club members who trod it will guarantee to buy 200 of those 300 bottles, then I'll very happily, and I'll, I'll, we'll do an event in the, gosh, I don't know when, in the autumn sometime or the, or the I, winter with I that sadly, wine. I sadly didn't tread it, but it's on my list of things to do, bucket list to come to Domain of the Bee. Well, the, other we, question, the other question, sorry, on the Genou, was that tasting sold out because of, uh, was it uh, sold out to members? I think it's not completely sold out. I think we'd sold 10 or 12 slots out of 14 last time I looked. Because you said something to me about members and non-members. Sorry if I'm talking publicly, but I'll have a look online. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's not yet sold out, but it's still got a little while to go. So it's, it's, and I'll, you know, it's intended to be a members only tasting and we will um, probably keep it to 14 people. If I get a sudden rush and get the feeling that we might get, increase it to 28. I'll have to open two bottles of all of the wines, but that's fine. Um, I'm even going to throw in a couple of extra wines into that one because I want to taste every vintage of Le Genou, so I'm probably going to taste, uh, uh, we might get six wines in that one. Okay, I'll keep an eye, eye out. That. Keep an eye out. Keep an eye out. Thanks always, as always, a lovely evening. Thank you all, and lovely to see you all. And thanks any for other Mark, Mark any Woodhams, other, I haven't seen you for a Any other time. questions from anybody before we go? Unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was I just started typing, but I wasn't going to be able to type fast enough. I, uh, Justin, I quite like to see a flow chart of all of your different vineyards, where the great where the, the grapes from the different vineyards go into the barrels, and um, if they go into twenty different barrels, which of those get blended into something else that goes into bottles? Mm, that's a good point. Uh, it'd be quite nice following, following on from David's question about yeah. 
you know, women Actually, and... Just go and do that now, if you don't mind, Justin. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do one of every grape, if you like. Every that single grape. Lovely. And what happens? <laughs> name the grape. If you could name the grape as well, that would okay. be really fulfilling. <laughs> yeah. Well, they all get named, obviously, when we pick them, so uh, that's easy. Okay. Is, is anyone an expert on blockchain? Because you saying that just makes me wonder whether there's a blockchain thing going on here that we should think about. They'll all need barcodes. Oh, okay. They're we just barcode every, every grape. Yeah. I'll digitise <laughs> barcode, but that's, that's quite easy to do. Most, most, of us, most of us are too old for blockchain. <laughs> what you can do is, when you spread the grapes, just leave a shoe in each <laughs> barrel, and then you'll be able to follow each barrel through, like whoever the shoe's in the barrel. Thank you for that practical suggestion. Really practical, Edward. No on problem. that note, we do, still, we do still have... Um, <laughs> on the <laughs> website the deposit you can put down for the 2020 club members weekend now we don't yet know if we are actually going to be able to do that and if we are going to do it which day we're going to do it on which weekend um but if you're interested and you'd like to come out if you put a deposit down obviously if we decide we can't do it that comes straight back to you there's no problem with that but we will hopefully decide if we get out there in the summer we'll talk to the local hotel work out a package around that weekend and we'll you know, what will it normally include is a package that doesn't include flights or transport, but includes you know hotel tra Food. travel around when we're there and 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 meals for the, for the weekend. Um, so if you're interested and would like to come out, keep an eye out for that because we'd love to see you. It'll normally be yeah. early October, so first or second okay. weekend of October. Sorry, Anne. second week in October. First or second weekend, but I, I have to check that the hotel's available. Obviously, we were checking. We had a date in mind. We had a sort of semi-provisional booking with them, but everything's changed now. We may not be able to go anyway, and all their other bookings may have shifted around. So um, we may have to do it with another hotel or do it differently. There is only one really, really good hotel in the area, and there's some other quite okay ones. But um, if it can be in the really good one, that would be nice because uh, really they did lovely. a good job for us last time. And anyway, one day we'll get you all out there because uh, it's such a great part of the world, and you'll you'll love it if you come out either for the harvest or for the the walk, the, the gourmet walk in May, Lisa Moriol, which we'll try and do next year. I think we're going to stop now because I've been talking for long. I've got a dry throat. So I need to drink something. Um, nice. Really nice to see you. Well, thank Lovely you for joining. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you all next time. Bye bye. Good thing.